Welcome to the AA Writing Prize. Um, we'll be spending the day doing um, pretty delicious work, looking at amazing papers, uh, talking about the craft of writing within an AA context, looking at different ways we communicate um, some of our deepest thoughts about the built environment. And it's an exciting um, list of papers to walk through today. Having spent yesterday jumping through a number of them, I felt really good about the state of writing at the AA. I think a lot of work has been done within history and theory studies, also the Writing Center. Also, I think generally supported by units and with a lot of love, and I'm sure there's a lot of discussion amongst postgraduates about the status of writing and how we're advancing um, work. Um, writing is the domain of the PhDs as well, so I know they share their love with us today. Um, this morning is really about the work of the first three years of the five-year program and um, how we look at the evolution of writing uh, across those formative years. And uh, I think it's some of the best work I've seen in ages around years one, two, three. So um, I'm excited for today. The format is as follows. Students um, will present for five minutes. Um, we will have um, opportunities to discuss after we've seen each year level. And uh, we'll also have an opportunity as a panel to have a discussion following the presentations this morning to take some some decisions, but um, I think the joy in this is really to share in some remarkable work, and I must say diverse work, diverse in terms of content, but also format and voice. What I liked very much is the level of um, expertise around citations and care with research. Um, we can have larger conversations today about chatbots taking over the discipline, but for today, just for today, let's delight in um, the human touch and uh, enjoying very much um, something the AA has excelled at for ages and will continue to. Um, I'm very pleased to have a panel in front of me this morning um, who have devoted a lot of time to previewing papers and will be a part of uh, a robust discussion this morning. If I could just ask that we go around the table to introduce ourselves, we can then pass the baton. And uh, I'll kick off with our external critic this morning, um, Bernard Veer. Bernard. I'm Bernard Veer. I'm um, Global Program Director of the MA in Fine and Decorative uh, Art and Design at Sotheby's Institute, um, which is next door, but also in New York. Um, and I write mainly on modern British art and architecture of the 20th century, but also more broadly on uh, connections between sport and architecture in the 20th century. Hi, I'm Shumi Bose. I know many of you in this room. Um, I am um, subject lead on what we call contextual studies at the Centre St. Martins, which is history and theory in this building, but also a graduate of the HTS program. And I don't write so much anymore. I used to write as an architectural journalist, but now I spend my time working with students um, on their theses and so. So really excited and honored to be here. Thank you. Thanks, Shumi. Sorry. Morning, everyone. I think I um, also know everyone for many years, and actually first time meeting Bernard. So, um, yeah, and uh, teaching across all levels in school, but then also uh, been really kind of working deeply with between cinematic and the architectural and the constructions of commons, and then the uh, um, actually media theories and relation between technology and uh, psychoanalysis um, and uh, so on and so forth. So there's, there's lots of kind of cross ground. And I'm also very excited to, to be here today to see the, some really excellent work emerging from the school. Hi, uh, my name is Nana Gupta and I think some of you know me. I organized the swimming pool symposium a couple of months ago, um, but I, I do more than that. I teach history and theory here, but in other universities in England. Um, and while I'm interested in sport and architecture, but specifically swimming, I'm also very interested in gender studies and uh, racism, uh, particularly in sport and architecture. Um, good morning. Um, I teach history and theory studies here in uh, Diploma. I've uh, been doing it for a while and um, Director of Architecture and Interior Design at Norwich University of the Arts. And uh, this is Mark Morris, Head of Teaching and Learning and uh, your ever-loving chair this morning. I'll try to keep us um, to schedule, but with the help of um, 
our dear Sylvie, who will call time and wave at you when you've got one minute left, and we'll, we'll make all um, work like clockwork. So um, if I could invite Rockforth um, to start the day with a presentation on kinetic and potential overstrike, kinetic is potential. So hello, my name is Rockforth. My essay is titled Kinetic and Potential, Kinetic is Potential. So first, I want to delve into this duality of space and place. Essentially, space is just physical place, it's location. But place gives space a meaning, often connecting to a personal or cultural identity. There seems to be both a dichotomy and connection of space and place. But as I see it, this connection is both explicitly and implicitly forbidden in the urban paradigm. So upon this notion of space and place, my essay unravels the architecture of the public playground. But why the playground? The playground is not a building. It's not entirely for everyone. Yet it is a tremendously unique environment. It is built for the child experiencing the early stages of space and place to reach beyond their known capabilities. And like many of our everyday urban surroundings, the playground is an urban intervention. An urban intervention that addresses the human body horizontally, vertically, its gravity and its weight. Whilst the space we call a playground is both dynamic and static, for many, the place we call a playground feels playful and memorable. It is a space to play, a place to be, a child's fun and adult's nostalgia. That's what makes it more or less meaningful. However, it is to what extent it is meaningful. Although traditional playgrounds often feature mobile equipment such as the seesaw and the swing, Aldo Van Eyck developed static forms in his playground designs. In spite of this, his unmovable play equipment literally and figuratively drove children to move and play. His designs form a social spatial connection towards play that characterizes a human rootedness within the playscape. My essay titled Kinetic and Potential, Kinetic is Potential, loosely translates to the dual sense of the kinetic and potential in Van Eyck's playscapes. Forms of energy when play and intangible elements of the architecture. Fundamentally, kinetic energy is a form of energy possessed by an object due to its motion. Potential energy is a stored form of energy due to the position of the object. Both can be transformed and transferred to one another. Both rely on the movement of the user, the child, to a large extent in Van Eyck's playgrounds. So implicitly, my essay reiterates the journey of the child through the Dijkstrap playground. The journey is almost cyclical, traversing through different play zones, the diagonal path, the sand pit, the jumping stones, and back to the climbing bars and the entrance that connects the city of Amsterdam. However, it is that within this journey, or these journeys, is where multiple realms of the in-betweens lay within. Dynamic and recursive, they align a multi-layered, experience-oriented space of which to various extents, kinetic forms and potential forms overlap. Play occurs within play. In the 1960s, Van Eyck adopted Bergson's theory of time, which conceives space as durée, which means duration. Van Eyck reevaluates durée in terrorizing time by breaking it up and making it accessible. This can be experienced through Dijkstra's triangular brick paving, for instance. Darker and clinker than the other paving stones, the path weaves and turns. It slows down the child's journey towards the play equipment. The path itself connects and demarcates different stages of kinetic movement, essentially forming interior in-betweens that coincide with exterior in-betweens through the dynamic pauses around its corners and straights. In Dijkstrap and across many of Van Eyck's playgrounds, play equipment is not based on a principle of central ordination. Therefore, this network is not hierarchical, but there is a coherence between the play equipment which lies in the relations to one another. The shift from the perception of time and space and uh, to the perception in time and space implies that activity and inter interaction of the user, which is play, this extends beyond physical space toward the notion of activity and identity related space. Children are able to identify, identify their space in every playground. Spaces become interiorized within spaces and as a result,
forms place or places. It becomes a child's place, their playground. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. We'll get to discuss a trio of first year um, presentations. I'll invite Mio up to present Paths for Thought, the Architectonics of Seclusion in Wittgenstein's Hut. Hi, my name's Mio, and as mentioned, my title is Essayed Paths for Thought, the Architectonics of Seclusion in Wittgenstein's Hut. Our affinity with and yet our mythization of nature and the hinterlands as places of contemplation, self discovery, and introspection is a motif which has pervaded the roots of architecture and our humanity since time immemorial. To remove oneself from society into self-imposed exile, to return to a communion with nature, and to seek clarity of mind under the most simplified of conditions in everyday life echoes our intrinsic desire for a reunion with our origins. This brings us to the unseeming ruins of a small hut in Norway, braced by mountains and inundating vegetation. Described at hindsight by the scholar Jan Estep as quote unquote, nothing special. Nonetheless, it was precisely for this reason that a century earlier, the Austro-Hungarian philosopher Ludwig Wittgenstein retreated to the site of Sonja Fjord in order to develop his theories on logical syntax. The relic that is Wittgenstein's hut therefore acquires a phenomenological meaning and its inhabitant, the individual subject, becomes something more than a neutral setting. In it, there lives a person who thinks, and this thinking is, in turn, that which dwells in the house. The material presence of thought as reflected in the construction of the dwelling and its formal elements is not so much a metaphor as the very subject of existential philosophy. In his hyper-specific specific designed hut, Wittgenstein thus proposes to us what is absent from modern day philosophical thought, namely a necessary rootedness in the fabric of everyday life. For Wittgenstein, following lines of inquiry on foot as well as in the mind was integral to his philosophy. In Sheldon, he spent a long dark winter contemplating logic and walking the paths that bordered the fjord and led up into the mountains. The landscape, ascetic, decisive, matched the thinking he undertook, and in the course of that winter he solved a major philosophical crux concerning the symbolism of truth functions. We are reminded through Wittgenstein's use of the German word Denkbewegungen, which consistently translates to thought movements or thought paths, how tracing and retracing paths within the physical space is utilized as a device to develop lines of self-inquiry and suggests the notion that thoughts gain spatiality. The landscape and its meandering pathways thus equate to an abstraction of the territory of his mind, an introspective journey where paths both physically as well as in the mind become a vessel for inducing lines of self-inquiry. In the words of the philosopher himself, I'm trying to conduct you on tours in a certain country. I'll try to show that the philosophical difficulties which arise in mathematics, as elsewhere, arise because we find ourselves in a strange town and do not know our way. So we must learn the topography by going from one place in the town to another, and from there to another, and so on. The condition which emerges between the site and the subject in question is an interrelation between spatial processes and thought processes as a form of grounding of thought in space, a threshold of the in-between where mind meets matter is established. Wittgenstein's distancing from society as a means to observe it also highlights our current psychological condition at large. That is one of disassociation as a byproduct of telecommunication. He shows us that perhaps by disconnecting, we can reconnect beckoning us to leave our devices and enter the hinterlands. Thank you for your attention. If we could um, see Beatrix uh, presenting the suburban sprawl of Los Angeles, a study on the failure of ideals. Hi, I'm Trixie Stork. And so in my essay, The Suburban Sprawl of Los Angeles, a study on the failure of ideals, I focused on the inherent failure of Los Angeles through its infrastructure, um, mainly focusing on transportation. And so um, in order to do this, I mainly analyzed Rainer Banham's text, Los Angeles, the Architecture of Four Ecologies. And unlike Banham's hopes for this automotive utopia, it was particularly interesting to um, read this text 50 years plus after its writing. Um, 
through the lens of what LA has emerged from and how it is today compared to the early 70s and even 60s when Benham uh, wrote this. And so through this, I was able to deconstruct the influences present in LA, beginning with its founding and through to mo modernity um, with the paradigm of LA that juxtaposes its reality. And so mainly seen in Hollywood, LA is construed as this idyllic paradise, um, but in reality, it serves as this case study of vast expansion, ideals, and the subsequent architectural attempts to solve both economic and um, uh, social inequality. And so in the text, Banham arrives in LA in the 60s, um, and he rejects this anti-LA mythology, um, beginning uh, to analyze the city. And right after these economic crises earlier on in the century, LA is this consumerist wonderland with a deep nostalgia for the past. And so he uses the analogy of a car um, to LA as the bike is to London and learns how to drive in order to experience the city. And so he delineates this topography into four ecologies, um, Surfburbia, which are the beach towns, the plains of Id, um, the in-between, and then the foothills in Autopia, which are the roads and highway systems. And so by dismantling Banham's romanticized ideas surrounding automobiles and his Autopia, um, I mainly focused on one quote, um, and it goes, because the point about this giant city, which has grown almost simultaneously all over, is that at all parts are equal and equally accessible from all other parts at once, which lacks um, substantiated evidence. And he theorizes this harmony of cars um, that weave through these complex road systems. While in reality, this city is no longer accessible, um, nor are cars this economic and socially freeing vehicle. And so then, um, I transitioned to kind of focus on how automobiles influenced the architecture of LA. And so um, I focused on both uh, public and private housing um, in order to serve as case studies for the greater population. And so um, while these case study houses never were never fully realized for the greater public, I think it further kind of proves the failure to address the crisis of poverty um, and uh, this housing crisis. And so um, for public houses, I um, kind of began to analyze um, public the uh, Sunset Strip and how these long linear streets kind of define the city um, and how they influence the function and how um, uh, even fast food restaurants and chains begin to develop uh, systems oriented towards the car rather than the individual. Um, and then in terms of private houses, um, I examined two um, rather famous ones, the Stall House and Eames House, um, which were built prior to Bonham's arrival. And so um, this idea of the car clearly defines these spaces with these long, low-lying horizontal elements um, and semi-private facades with these large exposed windows that create um, a continuity similar to Sunset Strip and also um, uh, the spatial experience of the house itself. Um, and while these houses do both merge private and public, uh, in order to attempt this political climate um, in functionality, they ultimately fail in addressing the need for mass housing as well as the context of society. And then ultimately this culminates with the modern result of LA as a city, um, which is defined by large urban blocks um, controlled by ownership money and access to welfare rather than the law um, and the systematic gentrification that's currently taking place. Um, and in the end, it's become a city that's neither mobile nor affordable, um, as Bannon prophesized in his text, um, resulting in a congested and expensive city controlled by wealth. Thank you. Perhaps you could stay there and we could invite your two colleagues to the table. Joining. Um, Three really different, um, fascinating papers and um, a trio from first year. Um, I turn it over to the table. Maybe we could kick off with some discussion around uh, the presentations we just had. That crazy, uh, yeah. Teresa. Break the ice. Good. <laughs> um, they are very different. So the best. This one. This one. This one. <laughs> Very different pieces of work, um, so I would like to know, first of all, where they come from. Um, 
in re response to your work in the design studio or uh, the series of seminars or personal interests and how you balance that? I can, I'll start. So for mine, it was more of a personal experience. So I'm from California, but not LA. Um, and I wanted to kind of understand and contextualize what LA is because um, kind of being interested in like the history of California at least, I wanted to kind of further delve into um, how LA was formed and kind of how it contrasts other cities. And so through the seminars, um, I particularly focused on Bannum's text because I found it entertaining and also kind of something that I could really um, focus my time on and then kind of further understand, um, especially because with LA, um, other cities are more defined by natural resources. And um, I was curious how the aqueducts kind of affected how LA was able to spread and then how that influenced the architecture and then the functionality. Um, for me, I've always been interested in, in this idea, uh, in this notion of in-between spaces, forgotten spaces. Essentially, the playground, or in terms of out of analytics context, it's, it's an in-between itself, an in-between of Amsterdam. Um, I've, I've just been always drawn to these mundane spaces. Whilst writing this essay, I first thought there wasn't much to write about the playground because the equipment wasn't movable. Um, it's not building, but I sort of related it to my um, previous experiences um, memories of playing in these playscapes. Um, I say it's, it's space to play, a place to be. And when writing this essay, I, I sort of reimagined my, uh, this journey, although I haven't visited the playground. Uh, but as a child, I'd reimagined this journey along the playground. Um, and that's, I think, finding value in these in-between spaces and further in-betweens within in-betweens. Uh, this multi-layering of meanings within meanings, that's what I, I'm always quite drawn to. I think mine was brought on by my sentimentality for nature and I was always um, brought up and kind of was surrounded by nature as a child and I'm from Norway where the hut is located and um, it always fascinated me how like the reasons behind why someone would retreat from society and um, what that shows us through that distancing from society because I've always believed that um, to truly observe something you have to distance yourself from it and his um, the case of Wittgenstein kind of highlights um, a lot of our current standings um, as a whole. And, and um, yeah. Sorry, as a, as a follow up, um, it's very interesting to have your um, answers because it becomes almost personal but then it becomes an essay within an academic context. So the distance, uh, the construction of the distance through the writing or the referring to other writers' work or design projects is another step. Um, now, I don't know if we need to go around, but it, it would be interesting to also understand how does that then become, and this is maybe a general question, how does that become a research um, and a piece of writing, uh, which is a different thing? I've got a live mic on this side here. I mean, I just have a comment more than a question. I mean, first of all, I'm really moved by the sophistication of all of your papers. 
Um, thank you so much for having the courage to go first. And that wasn't really a choice, but congratulations. <laughs> congratulations also. I guess the remark that I had was, um, again, to echo Mark and Teresa, that they're such different papers. And the way that I received them, I guess, is um, from Rockforth, I guess it was a, a sort of commentary on a type of place. And it seems like, I don't know if that feeds into your design thinking at some point. Personally, I'm not bothered if it does or not. But I think you're commenting on a type of place that you're observing. Trixie, it felt like this was more like direct analysis. You brought your perspective out a lot more. Also in the presentation of your paper, you're like, I did this, right? I wanted to look at this. Um, and I think, uh, Mia, uh, it was more of a sort of methodology or process that you were presenting. You know, the working through of thinking through the act of walking or negotiating nature. So, you know, process analysis and commentary, I think they're, they're quite different modes. And I'm just really thrilled to see this range and the ambition that you, you took your subjects quite seriously. So it was just a, as you should, so it's just a comment on that. Um, I don't know if you want to talk about, it's just an invitation, but um, how writing forms a part of your process now, like your first years, right? So I'm guessing that you haven't written tons of essays about architecture before. And you probably haven't designed tons of buildings before, but do you see do you see ways in which the practices uh, do you keep them separate in your mind? Is one a kind of more intellectual and personal pursuit, whereas another one is much more, I don't know, formally engaged? Or do you find there's a relationship between the things that you've been exploring? And I mean subject-wise, I mean for you. I think language for me has always been. Um, a way to inquire and articulate my ideas around certain concepts. And um, it's allowed me to develop, as you said, almost like a process or a methodology in the way I approach um, what I perceive. And yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if either of you want to talk about how writing fits in your practice or not, but feel free. Um, for me, so my essay began sort of as a spatial analysis, but I wanted to bring this um, concept of physics to question the na nature of reality and attempting to abstract physics and architecture. Um, by doing this, I'm not sure if it really conforms to uh, the definition of an architectural essay uh, must, must, an e must an architectural essay be based formally on, on architecture or should it not conform this sort of this, this territory of space and boundary? Should it reach beyond that? Because um, I think architecture, it's, or maybe good architecture, it's, it mediates one's sense of self and, and the world. There's this um, there's this connection that should almost push beyond um, this uh, this Euclidean uh, notion, and um, I think yeah, that's what that's what I wanted to do. Thank you. Yeah. What an answer! Dropping Euclidean before midday. <laughs> <laughs> Tracy, do you have any comments? I mean, you don't have to, but no, I for mine, um, in terms of how I write, I generally start very broad, but. Um, in terms of relating the two, I feel like in terms of what I'm interested in in what I think I'm interested in, I'm just starting. But um, at least I wanted to kind of understand how architecture can be tied like politically into um, cities. And so because from what I'm beginning to understand is a lot of architecture, like you can either argue it's its own individual entity or it is a part of society kind of advancing, advancing it. And so I think for me, um, writing like this helps me understand um, what architecture needs to be or what I want to do with it and how I can kind of further my own process and uh, inform my own designs and projects, briefs. Thank you so much for your answers. <laughs> Um, it's sad to show me and uh, Jerry's as uh, breaking eyes. I think I want to bring the conversation to breaking new grounds. 
um, through your work. And I think maybe through your discussion already with your peers and through studio and through your um, HDS involvement with tutors, um, you might be already aware of the things, the new things you are bringing to the table simply through, you may think of it as a writing exercise in conjunction with many other things you're doing. But I get really excited, you know, when, um, uh, when Rockforth, um, when you start taking on the kinetic and of course the playground in scholarship, there's a lot of understanding about it being a transitional space, you know, a space of potentiality, you know, there are things that uh, I've been discussing with, you know, actually very immediate with Nana in relation to swim, also a PhD level with um, um, a really kind of long research on, on children and play. But when you start to say, uh, to bring in the kinetic, um, it's actually I start writing down things like, oh, you're arguing that space or the making of space as a potentiality through which play materializes. So you actually start to link what we think of as sort of bodily movement that may not have necessary material consequences as directly material in itself. And actually in, in a reverse way, it's not just like um, whoever is at play, the person is also the thing, the assembly it's also at play, it's kind of playing back, you know, it's bouncing back, or it's kind of uh, deconstructing in itself, or bending, you know, or swinging, and uh, it, it wears and tears, and then you have to repair, and, and so on and so forth. And actually, there may be one really uh, fantastic um, uh, historical era of the emergence of the adventure playground, <laughs> which is in post-war Britain, was very prominent, there's also in, in other um, uh, places and um, the idea that material as something which in that period of time is re in relation to deconstruct uh, and let it uh, destruction, uh, things are in ruins, things are dilapidated, things are falling apart. They are actually now being kinetically linked to potential of space making, and uh, and that both the temporality and then also I think the um, uh, uh, the energy transformation that materializes uh, is actually what your your play is telling us. So for me, that is a tremendously amazing argument to, to have made through your writing. Um, and I think, Mio, I mean, this is sort of well known, uh, like Wittgenstein's house, you know, is uh, um, sort of iconic within architectural uh, history. And, but then you've not taken that as the start point of departure. You're actually looking at something which is half forgotten in the uh, um, in his space, like his, his own space of work, but all his relation to the broader topography and, and nature. And for me, that's again, the really exciting things you've uh, breaking new grounds. It's about understanding what architecture may mean to Wittgenstein, but also what um, uh, others who has uh, seen through, let's say through your work, uh, this new understanding of the, uh, what I mean, what's his famous for, you know, the empirical limitation on the metaphysical. So the metaphysical shouldn't be just, being basically uh, become transcendental. He's actually, let's say, arguing against that by bringing back to, um, uh, to, to, to his hut rather than the house. It's, it's that the barely there hut. Um, and I think Trixie's, uh, I mean, Bannum's contradiction <laughs> is again being revisited and so wonderfully kind of evolved. And, uh, and I think um, the ideals that, uh, and, and actually it's more sort of the failure of the ideals is the failure itself that Bannon finds productive, isn't it? It's uh, throughout his uh, both scholarship and his kind of contextual engagement between Britain and, and America. And I think that, that again is something, uh, um, and, and I think more a question back to you. Um, so that will, that will be my kind of a take on what you brought to the table. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, is that something you had thought about? Maybe you had thought about a different sort of contribution to knowledge um, and different kind of direction, a new way of thinking through these um, really kind of famous figures and, and let's say a uh, really rich topic that architecture has um, now changed by you. Mm -hmm. oh, yours. <clears throat> um, initially, I was interested in linking the topography of the site and the hut itself with the intention of the occupant, uh, Wittgenstein. Um, so I tried to link the formal elements of the hut to the intention and kind of finding the relationship between um, the physical and the cerebral and trying to create that point of connection or try to clarify that point of connection. Yeah. So, um, I sort of thought 
I sort of thought the playground, our love, our nice playground, as an artwork. Um, arguably, architecture, it's, it's a form of art. And I, you could compare the dive strap playground, which I studied, to a triptych. So, um, essentially, the spaces in between the canvases of the triptych is as important as the canvas itself, just like the, the equipment and the spaces in between. Um, and as, as the audience looks at this triptych, there's this exchange of emotions. There's this curious exchange where the audience lends um, their emotion to the artwork, and then the artwork sort of lends this authority and aura back to um, the audience, which is synonymous with the child and the playscape, where the child almost, there's this quality of the play, playscape, which is the authority and aura that you can make it your own. There's there's a belonging. There's um, you could make your own games within. You can rest. There are pauses. There is play, and um, it's it's just like the like this idea of an artwork that it's you can see yourself through the artwork. It strengthens one's sense of self and reality through almost if you were to zoom in on the, uh, the subject of the artwork and almost if in terms of the trip to trace your eye across the three different canvases um, the trip to each each canvas may be coherent to one another or relative but um, of course it's it's almost to, to some extent it could be a subjective perception for the child for the audience we're monitoring the situation, um, <laughs> and I'm happy that it's concluded. <laughs> uh, concluding thought from um, Bernard, and we'll, we'll move to our second year short list. Yeah. Great. Okay, I, I really enjoyed all three of them. Um, one thing that does kind of unite them is that they're kind of in the 20th century, kind of, and um, fortunately for me, that's. That's my specialism. Um, so, um, so I, I, I do have questions for each of you, and, and they're, they're they're more kind of specific than the um, the questions have been hitherto. Um, but I really, really like them. I preface this by saying I really, really like them. So I think one of the things that um, uh, Rockforth and um, was really great about your paper was that moment where Van Eyck kind of does something with a bomb site. And also, that put me in mind of Nigel Henderson's photographs of uh, children playing in the east end of London around Bethnal Green. And there's a connection. Oh dear, I set off the alarm. Uh, uh, there's a connection. <laughs> like, um, but there is a connection because the Henderson worked with the Smithsons, and the Smithsons obviously were associates with um, Van Eyck. So, um, in one sense, well, I, I really like what you were just saying about the artwork and everything like that, but in a way, if you didn't do anything with that space, if you left it as a bomb site, that would also be a kind of strategic intervention in a form of play, I guess. So I, I've just wondered whether there's always the opportunity to do nothing. Um, and, and, uh, and, and I think you, you kind of answered it, but I'd be interested in any further reflections on that, on, on that kind of, why not just let the kids play without the structure? <laughs> I mean, so essentially the point of the playground or space is to allow children to almost reach beyond their capabilities, their known capabilities and challenge themselves to learn, to gain a spatial awareness. Um, I mean, there's, there's, there's almost like three three points or three or like a trifold to what um, a playground can do. It's can develop de develop one's flexibility, one's agility, this pro proception of of the space, um, whether the child question themselves, can I fit through this tunnel? Can I hang the bar? I think if if you were if the space were to just be left as a bomb site, then um, the children would still be able to play around. It sort of links with 
uh, this idea of Wuna for Wuna uh, and Lenny Street. Um, I mean, it's it's up to the children whether whether they they build or build or play play with the remaining materials in the site. But I think what's arguably successful with Aldo Van Eyck's, or effective with Aldo Van Eyck's playgrounds is that um, rather than this physical spatial awareness of the game, there's this idea that his play equipment almost um, projects and mediates and relates meaning and this quality of not this quality of shifting from the perception of the perception and experience of the space to the perception and experience in the space which forms a place for the child almost almost like play, seeing a place within space or a home within a house and all that idea so that's what I think. thank you Beatrice um, I don't know whether you've seen this amazing documentary that Bannon makes out of that book uh, Rain of Bannum Loves Los Angeles, which is, um, and he cycles past here on the Brompton bicycle because that's what you do in London. You cycle on the Brompton bicycle and then go to Los Angeles and drive, learn to drive. How much of that kind of technological optimism that Bannum obviously has in that, how much of that is recuperable? Did you find at the end of this? Um, I mean, I appreciated his optimism for it, but I think. For him, at least, I think that a lot of his kind of claims are convoluted with this, like, infatuation with the city. And so, um, I think maybe in the 70s and 80s, with, maybe there was more optimism in terms of, like, how LA was. But I think he kind of overlooks and ignores this violence and kind of, um, like, divide between like the government and kind of the mayor of LA and then as, like as well kind of just solely focusing on like this road system which it's unlike anywhere else but I think today I mean I'm not too sure but at least um, in LA I just mainly focused on like my own personal experience and how many of the things that he claims just no longer um, pervade and yeah. Um, yeah, finally, um, and, and quite a quick question, I think, but the quote that you put up um, about him searching through was actually urban. It was kind of like it's a town thing. And, I, and, and also I've been, I'm not an architectural theorist, but I've been around architecture schools enough to know that this is going to bring up the question of the primitive hut. Um, so, um, so, um, so just a kind of reflection on if he is in this point of seclusion, why does he envisage the progress of thought and the topography of thought through the urban rather than through, for example, a jungle? Which Obviously, this is my interpretation. So I extracted it from his um, kind of epilogue to his um, Foundations on Mathematics paper. Um, and he developed all these ideas whilst he was there, supposedly. And um, I think he, as I mentioned previously, how he distances himself from society. He's looking at the urban context um, from the outside. Um, so that's kind of my perspective on it that he was reflecting um, on it, yeah. We are a bit over time, but uh, a last word from Naina. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. I, I found that though they're very different papers, they share some very interesting things in common. One of the things that you really talk about is the body. All of you touch on it, the relationship between the body and the mind. And that was really uh, very well articulated. Um, all of them, and I'm not going to, I've got a whole bunch of notes which I'm not going to go into, but I want, what struck me was the way that you wrote it. I mean, I could actually, in a way that what you were thinking was reflected in your writing style, the way that you were talking about physics, just simply in the way, sometimes the way the writing 
actually spoke like a scientific paper. There were these moments where I almost felt I was reading physics, considering I'm really bad at it. It was these, you know, there were moments. And the way you wrote as well, Beatrice, the way that you kind of pulled out um, the, the pace, uh, you know, uh, which was very much LA, but, you know, the, you know, it kind of almost had that. And in your writing, which reflected that this sort of thinking through almost the words. And I just wanted to now, now that we're seeing it, uh, you know, talk about that a bit. Do you, do you see that now when you look back at your work and how influenced you were by the content in a way in your writing style? It's not, but that's fine. But I just thought that was yes. I think by nature the essay was very introspective because you're dealing with philosophy and contemplation as the key topic. So um, that inevitably led, led me throughout the process to kind of contemplate and question the role of nature and architecture as a motif throughout history yeah. um, and kind of my relationship with it. So I think I fed through my. Um, my kind of opinions slash revelations on it, yeah. yeah. Sylvie, a last yeah. word. Uh, so not a question. Hello. Okay. Um, not a not a question. Uh, maybe a provocation. I'm just going to put it out there. Um, so again, really, really super enjoyable. We've talked a fair bit about like the distinctions between each one of you. We've, we have identified some similarities. I want to put another possible similarity out there, maybe to think about. Each one of you, and, and I wonder whether this has to do with you beginning your journey of architecture, have positioned yourself in relation to somebody, whether that is Wittgenstein or Banham or Aldo Van Eyck. And on, on one side, I think when you begin a kind of process of entering a new discipline, the fact of acquainting yourselves with your possible ancestry is really, really vital. I would encourage you to stick around if you can for the rest of the day, because I think what you'll see is less and less of that as we go up in the academic years. My question to you, which is a bit of a provocation potentially, but just keep it in the back of your head, why do all three of you choose to associate yourselves, even if it is by differentiating yourselves, to a prominent professional white male? Which all three of you have done. And, and again, just something to consider. Um, so the, the, one of the kind of jokes that our old head of department used to make is that when Picasso made Guernica, what he did was act, so in an, in, in, in an uh, oh sorry, Las Meninas, when Picasso painted Las Meninas in an, uh, in an attempt to kind of uh, dominate Velasquez, what he did was reinforce him. So when you try to position yourself and differentiate or in, by differentiating from the other, you reinforce the importance of the other. Not really sure, might be irrelevant, but worth maybe putting out there. Thank you very much. Yeah, nice provocation. Thank you all. Um, I'd like to shift um, oh, this note. It's like theater. I love it. Uh, I'd like to shift our table to our uh, first, sh second year presenter, Hugo, um, on the band of apostrophe S close for our Thank you so much, you guys. Thank you. Um, this is um, the banlieue. This is also the banlieue. Here's a typical image of the banlieue, and here is another typical image of the banlieue. Um, saying I'm from the banlieue is probably the worst way to be precise when it comes to expressing a place of residence in the Parisian suburbs. The word banlieue, similarly to the space that it refers to, outgrew its definition. Through my essay, um, I've tried to tell the stories of its landscapes, its people, its history, and what they represent in France's modern culture. The term is being misused or more, more particularly misaddressed. It's deeply amalgamated. Um, the banlieues are plural and the fruit of su successive births of urbanization and spatial production. They're in a way a continuous palimpsest dictated by gentrification, immigration, 
and, and even occupation. Um, I would like to thank my tutor, Joanna Pinara, for helping me uh, writing the essay. Um, I would like to thank you for the nomination. Uh, and I would like to, to pay a particular homage to, to the train, um, the RERB. Um, I'll start talking about rhythms and transportation around Paris. Why choose the train when so many modes of transportation seem to allow a better navigation through the Parisian forgotten lands? First, because documentation allowed it. Um, but second of all, because, because of the rhythm, rhythms of circulation um, and because they actually play a crucial part in understanding the urban layering or structure of Ile de France. Um, for example, the peripheral highway circumscribing Paris, which works like a threshold between the banlieue uh, and Paris intramuros, has a very complex urban infrastructure. The layering of multiple rhythms of transportation seen on the same frame or through the same window insinuates multiple dimensions of perception on the same place. Driving through this threshold or the peripheral highway is a completely different experience than crossing it by train or on foot for the bravest people out there. <laughs> the space reveals different parts of its nature um, where a certain rhythm of transportation, so the train, uh, will, let you see, will let you see through the windows of the beautiful Parisian houses. Um, others will let you see how people found shelter under a bridge. Other than how it moves through the landscape, um, the train offers something that no other mode of transportation offers, which is the people. It's not always about where we are or what's on the other side of the window. Um, because the train is a double-sided mirror. It's a theater play where the set keeps changing along with its passengers, or should I say actors. Um, and so as you can see on the cab ride um, on the screen, we don't see much of what makes those banlieues so interesting and diverse, but its actors do. People might be surprised at how entertaining um, this play can be sometimes. And um, so the setting of the play is uh, the banlieue and the stage is the train. As you might see on the screen also, um, once the train reaches the peripheral highway and enters the city, all goes dark, as you can pretty much see right now. Um, the train enters a tunnel, it's the intermission of the play. It's an interactive play that varies depending on our destination. It's either the lively atmosphere of the northbound train, as you saw in the video previously, um, or the bucolic and calm atmosphere of the southern banlieue. I'm very grateful for, for the discovery, not only because it has opened my eyes on the beautiful ambiguities of my own country, but because when dropping all relations, works, and leisure ideologically attached to this train, I found myself a tool or a tool for my health, sorry. Um, or as the situationists call it, a derive. A derive that is close to my heart and I am excited to engage with within the near future or future trips. As François Maspero said, a month on the RER can teach you more about La France Profonde than a year in Provence. Mm -hmm. The trip came to an end and my research has, my research has not given a clear response, just hundreds of other questions that show the exact purpose of my derive, or method. The complexity and ambiguity of the banlieue seems even more complex and ambiguous to me, and in a way attests to my statement and intention of showing the Parisian suburbs as a territorial question mark that fascinates people of every generation. Next time, when entering the RERB to leave Paris, I will never take my eyes off the landscape. I'll also never stop imagining the destination of these people getting off at improbable stations and disappearing at improbable crossroads. I'll leave uh, this quote of a pretty famous rapper <laughs> <laughs> that I think really sums up my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you. Body Ricardo, other timely meditations. Hello, nice to meet you.
My name is Ricardo, yeah, second year student. Um, so, thoughts, words, statements, accusation, anger, frustration, and again, words. A, a dear person pointed out that this letter, this essay is a letter, a letter to myself that wants to remind me of the frustration I felt at certain times in my career as a university student. A letter that wants to be a continuation of the, um, my previous essay, Warm Architecture, in, um, in silent contact in, and content, in which this time I wanted to dwell on my experience as a student, a student facing his tutor, colleagues, and architecture. I wanted to talk about the history of architecture and history in itself, and my explicit abuse of Nietzsche and his hammer. After all, it's easier to use weapons when you know they've, been, they've already been used and worked. An abuse that extends to Karl Popper, his demarcation between science and non-science, and my association with it to try and situate this discipline I am now studying. Homeopathic architecture, the non-science of speculation and intuition that fails to reject its past. I will continue to talk about my um, um, visceral need to understand responsibility I will, be a call, I will be called upon to fulfill, and my concerns for those who will give me those, those tools. I had fun writing warm architecture last year, but this time the purpose of the text is a warning to myself. I'm truly concerned about what I'm doing. I love imagining spaces, designing them, philosophizing, creating stunning graphics and renders, but is it that's all people ask me. I could easily graduate and sign projects without ever having questioned my small certainties. Who can confirm and help me understand that architecture is needed? The, that architecture is need, indeed a serious discipline. A letter to myself, highlighting the enormous hypocrisy of my everyday life. I take inspiration from the architects of the past, going to crisis when choosing Ariel Black over Vetica and blow up balloons during studio work, creating the famous hybrid system of the prestigious Unit 18. It is clear that irony is the interesting characteristic of this vortex of disjointed words. Irony that, together with the hammer, I think is the only weapon against this millenary system of certainties. Irony that I would wish to be applied in the courtrooms of universities, as I've introduced in the text, to highlight the contradictions of this discipline. I recall that by irony, I mean the Socratic irony, the Socratic concept, Greek irony, the moment when we realize that we are incomplete and the contradiction lies necessary to reach the highest step of truth. Um, all of us should shout that anyone who designs a staircase without thinking of an alternative is a murderer, as well being anti un against constitution. In fact, the third article of the Italian constitution says that Every citizen has the same social dignity, and the, um, the state has the duty to remove the social obstacles, or the obstacles of social order. I want to imagine courtrooms in our University of Architecture in which, as in a democratic state, the constitution prevails and the offenders of it are punished. We can be free to judge and expose the mistakes made so far identify those responsible and send them to an idealized prison dedicated to, to them. A necessary step for the common safety. Um, so I'll move on. These, these photographs, constant in the essay. These photos, fo these photos are a medium with which I can best support my concerns. With them I want to represent a contradiction, the continuous struggle between the destructive, static, freezing force of the camera and the invisible movement intrinsic to humans. A tension between those two powers in which the movement of, nat of the movement nature of humans always has the upper hand. But in this tension, in this struggle, the great loser is the background that, uh, which contains nature in motion. Everything we are created of is in motion apart from that which contains us. Static space does not follow the needs of people by adapting to them. Um, it's great static nature is uh, captured and can be frozen with the most dangerous and falsifying tool, the camera. People, however, cannot. Again, a letter with many question marks and hypocritical answers given by myself. I'm sure I will reconsider some of the things I said, but at the same time, I want to keep this letter tightly to always remember that I thought I've, what I thought today and keep track of my journey. Thank you all. Thank you. Mina, if, um, if you could join us for the five stages of grief.
Hi, I'm Nina. Um, this essay aims to navigate through the five stages of grief, of one losing their sense of orientation, starting from denial and ending at acceptance while meandering through three strands, a derive through the streets of London, a collection of thoughts and fragments of experiences, the question of error standing as a common thread. The removal of ornament introduces a brand new shiny thought process into architecture, brimming with precision, specification, and standardization, commencing an era with no room for error. This obsession over precision, the plausible result of industrialization, the thriving child of modernism disrupts the intimate dialogue of centuries, resulting in the negotiation between human and material to change radically. Then comes the age, age of the computational. The machine is no longer a tool that amplifies, but an ever-present third party that dominates the result. What is calculable becomes trustworthy. Even more today, schedules, routines and systems are designed precisely to maintain optimized outcomes. Meeting deadlines are crucial. Being late is unacceptable. The flaneur is an outcast. Orientation is reassurance. Although most of us adapt to the blue dot that glazes over our eyes, orientation is not standard. It's innate, intangible, and quite diverse. Though it is calculable in many ways, the components vary between humans, non-humans, and from culture to culture, making it much more complex than the duplication of units. The quantifiable is not always relevant, and being off the grid may be complementary when searching for new methods of narration. Francesca Hughes in Air Ar and Architecture questions, how might we engage with the possibilities that the new configurations of Air suggests? In response, I aim to speculate, how does Air itself become an agent of narrative? The experiment conducted with the altered domain device, consisting of a half an hour walk, the average commute to work in London, informs the context of this essay. The device is a compass that is mutated with a magnet, which is affixed around a ring, constantly shifting the north in correlation to the user's bodily movement. The user, while attempting to follow the rule of the real north, is no longer on a commute but from the A to the B, but lost in the in-between, rendering the transitional space obsolete. With similar attributes to the flaneur, the mutated compass becomes an agent of storytelling as an attempt of a new type of technology enabling a derive. Recognizing error becomes a cognitive act that disrupts the familiar and enables the exploration of the unknown. To be lost is a conscious project, a pursuit of its own. Moving from recognition to acceptance, all possibilities dictated through orientation are exhausted, facilitating new, pos new possibilities of space. In the final stage of grief, with absolute loss, one becomes wonderfully lost. Thank you. Um, if we could have your colleagues, uh, Hugo and Ricardo, join us for some conversation. <laughs> and um, I must say, these three felt curated like a trio. They share a lot, <laughs> right. um, a dedication to the urban, um, an interest in yeah, engaging this to a certain figure of the train or the photograph or other. And, um, so about that, this is my medium. And um, I'm sure we'll, we'll unpack these things with you. But um, as, a, as, a, as a trio, um, I think each um, builds on the next in a really interesting way. Um, Wanted to throw it to our table and um, strike up a conversation. Yep. I'm dying to start this time because there's no ice to break. And I, I'm, I don't know, I'm a meltdown. Um, so, and I, I need to superimpose a narrative here. Uh, so we have three papers from first year, which are in different ways, desperately trying to anchor themselves in the mountains, in the motorways, uh, in the playground, um, both culturally by choosing a, an author, a reference, and by literally pinning something uh, 
in the ground or and failing somehow. Um, so congratulations to all of you. And now you're taking us to, through three very different but amazing journeys which are opening up so many questions in different ways, in the city, within yourselves, within the discipline. Um, and I think you, you're giving a fantastic lesson to them, um, to us, and confirming that once you, you, know, you grapple for references and certainties, and then the second year comes. And when I started to teach, I was told, the second year is the most difficult one. Especially, not right at the beginning, I don't know if it's before or after the Christmas break, this is the real moment of identity crisis. Oh my God, what am I doing here? And you're the proof that it becomes the moment where something unlocks. Maybe it's just a big hole and you like, what am I doing here? So it, it is amazing and it is amazing. But what I would like to do, instead of you now talking about this, I would like your colleagues to ask you questions. Is it, is it allowed? Uh, we're at the AA. Anything's allowed. Okay. <laughs> he said yes. Can you ask them questions? Because they don't have, they only have answer, uh, questions. You have some answers. Like, what's going to happen to me in a year's time? No, Teresa, I think that's a really good point. It was something that I think, uh, building off of Sylvie's comment at the end of the first year table, I was having similar thoughts. Um, again, I'm again to echo Teresa. And I'm just giving you guys time, right? <laughs> just to echo Teresa. Um, it is incredible to see you all taking this moment of second year which gives you the opportunity to um to yeah build your own kind of project to get into intellectually and probably a project that won't end no it might change shape but we're all still in our projects like that mm -hmm. and it's true that in second year you might have the courage to try and forge your own path to some extent um again this is just a comment partly to build time but i really enjoyed um the sort of angst that you're building, it's not an angst that just happens, you choose it, right? And I think um, it reveals something about, maybe I can echo the question that I put to the first panel. Do you think you can talk about your experience in writing as part of your broader practice and how one reflects the other? I'm also mindful that I, yeah, again, as Teresa said, you didn't, you weren't bothered about finding conclusions. So I did have another question as to how you feel about the application, if there is any application of your thought experiments. So look, you guys can answer either one. <laughs> it's ma mainly the same question, how you're thinking about the application of what you've done or and how this relates to your own position as budding practitioners. Because clearly all of you have taken a simple writing exercise and chosen to do something else with it, as you are doing in your design projects and in life, I'm sure. So could you maybe speak to that parallel or connection if there is one? Go on, there aren't any wrong answers. We're just enjoying conversation. Thank you. No, um, I just want to you know, um, make the link between uh, what I'm really interested in and, um, and um, what I did this time for, for HTS, because it, um, it was never a big uh, thing for me to, to, uh, to spend a lot of time writing my essays, at least since I'm at the AA. And, um, and uh, I think it was um, a mixture of what we were doing, doing in studio, um, a lot of the theory research, um, where I kind of uh, discovered the importance of, um, of, um, of writing what I was thinking of. 
Uh, it was always, I think, a lot of what uh, I did in first year was um, was um, accumulating a lot of knowledge because we learned a lot in a in a very short um, time. Um, and I regret not writing more because then things die inside of my head, and I and and so I I discovered it through this course this year, and I and similar to the derive that I found, it's something that I that will follow me, I think, uh, till the end of my education. So it was a bit, a bit of a revelation. Mm. Um, I think my, I would also kind of like to explain the link. I think mine is kind of a combination of an academic interest and something that I um, started to feel after I moved to London. Um, my academic interest is more into um, the miniature and mapping in miniature. Um, so different standards, different understanding of units, different ways of looking at mapping and, diff and understanding urban or rural context. Um, and there's, there's this really odd his moment in history in the end of the 1800s where um, there is no one um, that is legible, let's say, to teach people in the Ottoman Empire to draw in a specific way. So people start to kind of make up these ways of drawing that are kind of like a miniature, that are kind of like um, more Western drawings. And then there's this weird, odd moment of combinations, which I found, which then, because they were, they, these were documents, they weren't seen as legible. Um, but I just find them absolutely beautiful and tell a great story. And this kind of combined with, whenever I wanted to actually go on a walk, leave my house, a year and a half after I moved to London, I kept doing this thing where I would leave, I'd be like, okay, I'm going to infinitely walk in the city and, where, and see where I end up. And then I would always find myself back at my doorstep. And I was like, why am I doing this? Why am I doing this? And it just, and I, and I was like, I wonder if, because I kind of want to stay, and I keep looking for the things that direct me back to home, even though I actually don't know, after, like, anywhere after a certain periphery. I just kept going back home, going back home. I was like, okay, I really have to think about why I'm doing this because this is very odd. So they kind of merged in a way in this essay. Um, so, um, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of understanding that the architecture is a, one of the most multidisciplinary subject fields ever, and so everything is accepted or not accepted. And now to like include the writings, uh, <laughs> how to in include writings and also like future career is it's, it's really a question mark. But um, also comparing from last year, I I enjoy writing because it's a moment of um, like pure freedom where it's just you, your words, uh, and and I mean not not English not being my first language. I also enjoy writing in Italian as I've done all my education in Italian. So I have more words in that, in that language, and having words uh, helps you create your thoughts and everything. So it's fundamental to, to find a way to express yourself. And, and, but I love the, the English output, of course, of, of the essays. Um, but yeah, is there include, uh, I remember this question, including writing in your career in the future in the architecture field. Surely I will do it, but I'm, I'm also scared that words are very easy to say, and, and again, they're always accepted or not accepted. So, without transferring words into like, actions or uh, at least, um, yeah, I, I don't know, really. I mean, I was struck by particularly, sorry. I was struck particularly by a couple of phrases um, in your struggle, which you kindly wrote and shared with us, which I thought was really brave of you. Um, and I think it was interesting just to note uh, something that you said chimed with something that Rockforth said. There was this notion of should and obligation of um, producing something that seems to haunt, um, well, all of us, but particularly undergrad students seeking their way because, you know, one is assessing, well, how useful is this? What am I doing with my time? And it has taken me many years of therapy to acknowledge that I have this weight of productivity that is somehow acquired by the culture that we live in. One more comment for you would be, um, I recently read and listened to books that were 
books that were written in their second language. And I find it really interesting. I think this applies if we can think of architecture as a kind of language or a kind of practice, if you like. Writing in something that is unfamiliar to you um, amplifies the agency you have no, to choose what words you're using and to build from a framework that you have constructed. Whereas what, often when we're speaking in our own languages, we're falling into tropes of culture that we don't even know we've absorbed. So don't see it as a, as a weakness. No, this insecurity in dealing with a subject or dealing with a language or dealing with this obligation of what the application of it is supposed to be. Um, I think that's all, that's all, that's all the comment. Thank you. Is it okay if I butt in? <laughs> so happy. Um, so all three of you seem to deal with um, navigation um, and orientation, so maybe a lack thereof of orientation. And um, I was wondering if you guys found or um, have dealt with like a framework of um, navigating perhaps your identity or, or your topics through your essays, if that makes sense. Um, I think taking the example of the train, like um, um, if you don't have your phone on the train and, and you just go from one point to the other, crossing Paris from one side to the other, there's a lot of things that happen in your head. And I think every, everyone, everyone has this where, when, where you stay long enough in a car, you just, your breathing slows down, your brain slows down. Everything, every idea channels through your mind in a way slower. Everything seems clearer, and uh, and this is why I think, um, and this is why I think it's like a really good derive because because it's it's a real tool. Like um, it, it really time time goes by at a very 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 different. It doesn't it doesn't um, again it's for, I, for my method to, to, um, uh, it doesn't respond to the same. To the same rules of, of time and space when when you're in a train or in yeah in a, and um, and yeah this I learned so much about myself I learn more about myself uh, in when I'm waiting in a car or in a train than when I'm actually in school or working and my brain is going a thousand miles an hour as you said the load of productivity <laughs> um, suffocates <laughs> yeah. Just to, because you said something very interesting, right? And then I was thinking about the way that your, your essays were visually uh, structured. And you had this very interesting moment, Mina, where you kind of changed the font, which made me kind of reread that. And there's a lot of that happening. And if I put your essays up as almost visual and then not read the content, what you just now said about time and space, that's something that happens in writing as well. There's this idea of time, space, and, but you talked about moving, but how do you bring that about? How do you see yourself also bringing those ideas of movement, time, space into the work and the way that you write? Not purely the way that you structure the text, but the way that you write, because it has that quality. Architecture and writing has many things in the way you zoom in, the way, you know, how you structure time. It is there. Do you see yourself trying to do that as well when you write, or do you see yourself doing that more later? Um, well, in, I, have a, I feel like I do have a tendency to kind of lean towards fragments in a way. Um, not necessarily because I find them secure sometimes, but also because um, it, it, it is when, an, when there's an anthology of thoughts that you're going through, I feel like it's more true to um, myself in a way, um, rather than trying to make a point or kind of structure the text in such a way that it kind of um, caters my opinion and instead of trying to convince maybe the other person, um, kind of leaving the text to kind of explain itself in the best way possible, I suppose. Thank you. I think um, I found very interesting what you said about the space and how we consider it uh, when writing. Um, and I think, uh, 
everything is kind of relative when reading, where also the way we address and the way we talk, the way we, we transfer, and we, it's, it's something to master, but to, uh, we transfer our voice through pap on paper and, and p it's a conversation. It's, it might be a one-way conversation, but, but it's still a conversation. I feel like um, uh, other than the, the visual structure of an essay, the way we structure our voice is, I, I realized this year, is very important because it does change time and it does um, make space feel very different sometimes, depending on how we articulate it. I think these are all both a very interesting question. And again, it's extremely personal the way someone approaches writing and uh, it can be considered as a form of art, as a form of architecture. In a way, art has, um, where everything matters in the text. Also, yeah, the, the layout of it that gives another, another hidden meaning. And I, I'm really aware that some people have, like, it's a, it's a capability that is amazing in expressing these ideas. Um, the, the text as a piece of art itself, uh, or as an architecture where space, so art doesn't have um, to include space. It can be either like super poetic or other ways to express words or to visualize words uh, in a way that are artistic, like be beautiful or uh, also architecturally. But um, the, the way I, um, I, put, I, um, I saw myself writing this essay as, was the, the, the quickest way to really write down in both in my language and in another language uh, flows of thoughts or ideas that I had throughout the year. And I think in my like, continuing in this direction, I, I feel more comfortable writing in that way as, as really a medium of um, like the quickest possible way to remember your thoughts. That it can be also through to a project that in, in this project in, during this brief that I didn't feel this year at all. Like in my brief, I really express myself and this is me, my uniqueness, and I'm gonna put as much effort as I can into defining this is beautiful visual that represents me. But throughout all the different subjects in AA, the course studies and HS, I felt this as a intuitive way because of it's intuitive, intuitive writing. And I think it's what made me enjoy it because there, um, there are sort of no limits into, well, there, there is a word limit, a word count, but um, yeah, as a medium of really remembering your thoughts and not leaving them in a place and, and then moving on and continuously changing, continuing ideas. But again, all thoughts can be refuted, so yeah, it's a... You're still in that line, watching it happen live. Yeah. Um, my question, I think it, it sort of feeds off uh, the previous comments about approach to architectural writing, maybe the traits of an architect. Um, so I'm, I'm asking, do you think you have any constraints to your way of writing? I mean, it, it sort of depends on um, how you define constraints. And if not, how would you extend um, your written piece? Um, the, the constraints, uh, yeah, you can, I don't know, uh, I'm, I'm nobody to say things, but like you can build your own constraints and of course uh, um, have, have total freedom because it's a personal, it's a personal thing of your piece of paper and yeah, in this university you really have no limits and again, that's a, another differentiation that I, I felt previously in my experience in Italy where uh, there is a like, real historical constraints and a sort of fetishism towards history and towards the past and the critics was also towards that. Uh, but um, yeah, it, and also the continuation of essays, that's also fascinating. Like uh, if within the word count, you don't have enough space or time to express yourself, like to keep track and, and, and continue because it's, a, it's always a, like a straight line that has to add, uh, add pieces and, and thoughts. Thank you. Um, 
Well, I'd like to actually talk about, if that's all right with you, the constraint inside of the essay um, regarding also the mapping, uh, because along the lines of um, to be conscious, uh, to be lost as a conscious project, um, in mapping, I feel like it is quite prevalent. Even the most alternative maps always have kind of one rule, one constraint minimum to follow, which then provides and enables a huge amount of freedom. Um, so in Jodorowsky's in Poetic Act, it's walking in a straight line, even if that means uh, going into someone's house, stepping on their bed, politely asking them if that's all right, and then leaving the house with their other friend. Yeah. Um, or it, many others, or it's about being, or it's a map to be able to become lost, or it's a map that kind of doesn't describe the street, street names, but describes the emotions in the street. It's, it's a very wide range, um, but I think that one constraint then kind of liberates a lot of new possibilities. And with um, the mutated compass, the altered domain, the idea was that the constraint would be to actually look for the real north. It doesn't really maybe exist at all. Yeah, I totally agree with Mina. I think constraints are actually a blessing. I, I feel in general uh, constraints, I, it's better to have a lot of constraints than sometimes, not always, but uh, to have a lot of constraints than be totally free, because then you're facing the sartrean angst of being able to do everything you can do. Um, but yeah, I, I personally, for, for my, my, the, where the constraint lays in my, um, my time writing, I think it was probably before the AA, um, where in the, in the French um, education system, um, you always need to, to come up with an answer or a synthesis of your argumentation. Uh, it's always very structured, the uh, thesis, antithesis, synthesis, dissertation style. Um, and here, um, I actually ended up with more questions than I, than I had at the beginning of my essay. And if, honestly, if I could ask quench questions all my life, I think I would do that. Because <laughs> it's, um, yeah, I think uh, um, the Socratic way of life is a bit more seducing than uh, trying to find answers to everything. Yeah, especially. <laughs> yeah, I think questions, oh my god. <laughs> Ago. The, yeah, green light. Um, just add to that, um, actually, it's a question about who, as in, I think it's been so, um, I mean, the, 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 the responses you've been giving and, uh, and the observation of how, you know, um, you, you are actually a trio in some ways in this kind of the identity question that's coming from you and uh, the self-discovery process um, is hugely valuable. But then, Maybe my question is more about these others that have shared your journey somehow. And maybe, you know, in, um, uh, in Hugo's case, it, you've actually shown images of perhaps compa companions, you know, or those who, it's a wonderful phrase that you say, who, who got off at the improbable stations, you know. And uh, do, at some point, and then also in um, Ricardo's case, I think those really striking images are blurry figures, and they seem to always occupy kind of this uh, limbo zones of thresholds, you know, like um, in between, and also as, as sort of a, a groups that you wonder they relate or not relate to one another, do they, are they aware or not? Um, and uh, in, in Mina's case, you know, like this wonderful moment, uh, I mean, literally like wonderfully lost moment. <laughs> um, how much of these, um, uh, these um, let's say the journey is a shared journey and um, that you think of acknowledging and how much specificity that you feel is necessary in the sense that your essay is also someone else's essay that it becomes specifically shareable and that it's kind of creation of this kind of resonance. Of course, we link it back to readership. I think it's more that self discovery, that self is sort of larger than just who I am or who you are, but then that. Uh, I just want to, very curious about your thoughts on that. Um, I 
I feel like my essay will make any sort of sense if it wasn't for the people. When I was saying two seconds ago um, that there's, I ended up with more questions. I think there's a question per person that lives in the suburbs. Um, there's the only thing that changes the territory around the donuts around Paris is, uh, is the people. Everything is about the people. The train ride would be horrible if I didn't have either my phone or the people in the train. And um, no, maybe not, actually. Maybe not. <laughs> Probably not. It was just for the... Um, but um, um, I feel like the, um, the people is the answer to, to everything when thinking of writing. And I would love to share it with people. I would love to actually engage with people. I would have, have loved to engage more with people. Sorry to jump in on your question, Dorian. But did oh, Mike, sorry. If I could just add a tiny caveat to Dorian's question. Did you have the reader in mind when you were writing? Reader, in my opinion. Um, good question. <laughs> I, I don't think I know. No, I don't know. Um, no, yeah. But we can come back. If you want. <laughs> <laughs> okay. um, well, I, I suppose my the 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 uh, odd little compass kind of became my friend, and I actually feel very little power over the text that I wrote, um, because it kind of, that, that's what I was kind of looking at. That's why I was also interested in kind of Rainer Banham and his relationship to the car, because rather than while I was watching the documentary, I felt this like, it, it was, the conversation between them was so much more interesting than the things that they were actually seeing, maybe even though it was kind of vice versa. Um, and I, I just felt, because I mean, I was getting very odd looks, people kept like, whenever I stopped, people kept looking at me and like, of course it was quite fun and I had a camera on my chest. So in that odd little moment over there, there's police looking at you, there's um, people looking at you, you're going into spaces that you might not want to necessarily go into maybe, and you can't do anything about it. Like I was following people and they were of course very nervous because, and I didn't understand why they were nervous and I ended up in a garage next to their car at one point and they're just like, and I'm like, I, I'm just, I, I can't do anything. So this, this mutated compass kind of became my friend in a way because we were companions of this odd little derive that we were going on and I would say that's whom I shared the essay most with. Um, but then I guess I suppose there's a lot of voices inside because the fragments are um, kind of stories that are pulled from people around me also. Uh, like a girl I met in a concert really randomly who had a right and left tattoo, but on the other way around because she confused her orientation. And I found it quite beautiful that she didn't try to correct herself necessarily mm -hmm. by putting right on the right side and left on the left side. And she kind of embraced her sense of disorientation, which I thought was quite spectacular. Can I add one last thing? I, I, I really uh, agree with you on the, um, um, on the method or the derive of becoming um, a friend or becoming someone that you, that you engage with, mm -hmm. like a presence. Uh, when you were talking about, at some point, ending at places you shouldn't end, there's this one stop before um, the um, Paris airport, mm -hmm. which is like the closest thing um, that the closest thing gets to for of being sorry an, an absolute non place it's just um, work um, not even workshops I think uh, I think just storage rooms in the suburbs uh, yeah and and the only people that I've seen or the only presence that I felt because the train was almost empty was the train was the sort of the the string that linked me back to humanity. <laughs> you know, I, I like the question, and if either the, the act of writing is um, to, towards, like, to be accelerated towards some, some, some other, or it's purely an in, interior uh, thinking process. And I think, I don't know, I can only speak for my case, but um, while I was writing, um, I was not focusing mainly on the person reading the essay, but 
Uh, I was really hoping to to get comments and to have a feedback of this essay, and I still I still would want to like in general for all the all the writings because um, not for the acceptance or not of the essay, but to see that for the reaction if if and again I said at the beginning um, a dear person um, made me notice that this is in a form of a letter and I haven't if I thought about it I haven't really written many letters in my life but. I've done, and it was always, it was towards someone, but a letter, a very introspective letter, where you have to be yourself and to see the things that, to say the things that you, you are. And, but then again, there is a, um, I don't know the word in English, but like um, someone that received, received the thing. And in this case, I, I would love that, or also in the future career, the, the receivers of, of these letters would be, yeah, my colleagues, teachers, but also, to, to, to have a discussion and debate that I didn't have, unfortunately, during the HTS, for probably my absent or... But I'm still kind of starving for this uh, um, debate that, that also I would love to happen in, uh, in the classrooms and studio works, and that's why I introduced in a very uh, abnormal way the, the concept of courtrooms, but it, I don't know if I regret it, but it's, no, it's not relevant. To, um, to have more debate and to see that everyone has uh, a receiver for the things they say, but yeah. Sure. yeah. We're out of time, I'm Thank afraid. You. I wouldn't say that we should stop this conversation. What's been beautiful about it is it went from a sort of panel with you to a round table. <laughs> and as it should be, um, I think these conversations are ongoing. I think the points you raised about generating debate or more feedback, hopefully events like this also attend to some of this. It's not always in written feedback, but I think the wider discourse of the school is a part of addressing the writing. But uh, thank the trio. And uh, <laughs> I want to offer a comfort break of 15, minutes. 15 whole minutes. That's comfort and a half. No, no, no. Uh, we'll come well, back. Let's make it 10 so by the time we sit down. Yeah. Okay, so we'll start back in earnest on the hour, but let's say 10 minutes. And uh, we'll welcome uh, the third year when we return. Thank, thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. So, yes, my name is Charlotte Birrell, and my essay is called Sympathies of a Walnut. So, in traditional Chinese medicine, um, things are good uh, for what they look like. Walnuts, as you can probably tell by looking at them, are good for your brain. Ubiquitous in all ancient medical cultures, the doctrine of signature links nature's forms to their healing properties. Western uh, medicine has mostly abandoned this concept, but some links have been proven true. Walnuts, in fact, are abundant in omega-3s and are good for your brain. But I believe that resemblances like the walnut brain transcend mnemonics um, and that reviving their power can give us a way to reconnect to the human-earth relationship that has become so broken. Passed down to medieval Europe uh, from ancient Greece, the doctrine of signatures, originally a memory device, became overlaid with faith and magic. It was believed that the original relationship between nature and word was dest destroyed at Babel as a form of punishment for man by God. Languages became separated and incompatible with one another. They lost this original resemblance to the things that they had been the prime reason for the existence of their languages. And God had hidden messages in the natural world for humans to decipher. It was thought that the remaining signs in nature and the diversity of world languages was, that, was how the unity of nature expressed itself. So looking back at medieval literature, C.S. Lewis noted that he noticed repetition to a point of banality. Back then, there was no such thing as plagiarism. This, however, becomes the main evidence that the aim of writing at that time was not one of self-expression or creation, but to hand on information and to understand the world in earnest. The power of resemblance was so strong because there was no formulated human experience of the object being written about. The medieval experience of the walnut is not that a walnut looks like a human head, but that it is a human head because God had expressed it so. However, after the 16th century and the establishment of the Linnaean system, words and things became distinct for all time. 
The walnut was no longer a human head. It had a distinct name, Juglans Regia. And this was, it was more economically viable to destroy the power of resemblance and to replace it with a complete mechanization of language. As Lewis writes, there are only, we are only left with the remnants of this power, a discarded image. It would be totally normal in medieval times to believe in all kinds of magic. In British folklore, for example, it was believed that burning any part of an elder tree, sorry, what is happening? To believe that any part of, burning any part of an elder tree would release the witch trapped inside it, known as the elder mother, and that she would curse you. Well, burning elder trees actually releases toxic gases that can make you very sick. It actually contains cyanide. So it is quite possible that you could die after burning it. It's a useful kind of magic to have this story. It really frightened people and it probably saved lives. And I feel like you're kind of compelled to give the elder tree more respect by knowing it has a spirit. These kind of powerful allegories, while they can still work um, with your children maybe, it's, it's kind of impossible to imagine now as an adult to, to have the kind of empathy that a medieval person would have experienced towards nature. However, it is possible to revive this. The work of, Jen, uh, of John, John Hedgick, for example, uses, he uses his poem, poetic imagination by giving his architecture spirits, the spirit of a gardener, a musician, a painter, a suicide. A deep sorrow or joy becomes visible to the viewer, not through words, but by, through something more intuitive. Through sympathies, he shows that us that it is in the capacity of architecture to situate us in space, decipher our relationship to mother nature, and it humbles us in the process. In an era where all knowledge is reduced to physics, where capitalism has taken root in the earth and is causing mass destruction, we're in dire need of a shift in culture. We need not believe that all nature is an expression of God, but perhaps a similar al allegorical device adapted in our literature a little magic or a little faith would serve as a way of fostering a culture where nature becomes, comes before economic-led destruction. And by seeing ourselves in those creatures that surround us, by shrinking ourselves to the scale of a walnut, we can acknowledge the stories of their lives, learn their lessons and heed their warnings. By looking deeper, we can awaken ourselves in ourselves something that has been lying dormant for so long, perhaps in finding resemblances we might liberate a compassion from inside of us in a reality where paradoxically, humans perceive themselves at the center of everything. Thank you. My name is Turda. Uh, my essay is called A Twofold Displacement, The Amnesic Attitude in Contemporary Legislation. On the 6th of February, 7,584 buildings collapsed in southeastern Turkey. Earthquakes happened twice, first with the families inside, then with the snow on top. In the days following, the rising amount of loss, a number so inconceivable, was justified by the asserted conception of the earthquake as fate, destined to happen and independent from human intervention. I argued the opposite. Nancy defines an event by its way of being a shock. Depending on sets of condition, an event can be only titled as such if it escapes our rational grasp, proves assumptions wrong. In the epicenter Kaya Mamrash, the assumption was of the inhabitable house, the permanent home, a place to live. On the dawn of sixth, the wall thought to be owned came to light with the paint and the crying drawings remaining on the exposed facade of the adjacent house. Assumption was proved wrong. No one owned the house, the street, or the lives lost. The event appeared in the number, 7,584. The essay looks at the latter of the two conditions for the event to happen. First, the incompetent construction of the houses by the disregard of building regulations. And second, the remaining of such, the mere state of continuing to be, by way of declaring amnesia, through the legislature of the Turkish Republic. In 403 BC Athens, a crowd burst into tears for a poet staged the capture of Miletus. He was fined for a thousand drachmas for recalling them to their own misfortune. 
The misfortunate event was seen to be brought by a search for revenge. Hence, it was banned by the Senate. The first written instance of amnesty laws was born out of order d'amnesia. Although closely intertwined in the term, in the time, term evolved to sit in an opposite of its origin. The one who forgets has been replaced from the people of Athens to the coeval members of the parliament. Now, amnesty granted forgiving, proposed a momentary displacement of the laws by a forced scenario to invent a short-term reciprocal contentment. Amnesia of Athens and the Karma Marsh earthquake crossed paths in 2018 with an omnibus bill presented in the Turkish parliament. It included the zoning amnesty, a retroactive law to exempt illicitly constructed buildings from demolition with their permanent certification. Despite the Turkish parliament's fairly chronic forgiving of constructions since its establishment, the case of 2018 is the most recent and perhaps the most conven conventionalizing instance of its anteriors. By use of amnesties, the act of contractors, or the mutahit, meaning the one who premised, were legalized upon any un un incompetent construction, gained an unsolicited ascendancy over complemental professions of the industry. The promise they hold of the inhabitable house was overruled. Then the reprieves of the past paved the way for the carefree practice of the future offenses. Rapture of the architect from the art of construction realized by the hand of the state and its most patriot contractor. Although so embedded to its history, the implementation of zoning amnesty took a sharp increase from the 1980s by the neoliberal strategies of the Turkish state. They were the conscious outcomes of a cost-benefit calculation chosen over, over the defense of an existing setting with the taken risk of southeastern city's utter distraction. A number was muttered among the three advantages of zoning amnesty. 50 billion Turkish liras. It was in fact a mere result of an optimistic estimation. The ultimate gain harvested from amnesties was less than half the anticipated with the concomitant loss of 50,000 lives in the earthquakes. The monetary cycle was predestined for the perpetual sustain and the event happened on the foundation of this hedonistic conditionality. Inevitably, amnesty presented a lawful crime for its own conclusion was nothing but a foreseen massacre. The displacements within the constitution instigated the agonizing evanescence of the tangible got twofold. Laura argues such a forgetting leaves traces. I have to agree, remains persist. They persist despite an amnestic instinct. The trace of the zoning amnesty, the forgetting of the laws once painstakingly committed is not just made of miles of concrete dunes or the replacement tents that have been inhabiting the surviving families, but also on the collective memory of a generation. Earth became concrete, Water became snow. Amnesia wrought the memory for once never to be forgiven. Thank you. So my, uh, the course I was in uh, in the first term of this year was um, Gravity Matters. Uh, it's sort of a metaphysical exploration of weight and lightness in art and architecture and that was with Catherine James. So I will begin this. Let me just check if the audio is a little overpowering. I apologize. The tower of petrified entropy is awakened by the slightest vibration of the ground beneath the system, the rise of tide around the structure, or simply the intervention of a brief squall. It is the transient hang of the mass in space. The shattering of balance, which occurs in a tick, is the real meaning of my work. It is something inevitable, suspended between the dry connections of stone against stone, surrendering weight to surreal lightness. With my art, I shift rock, Redolent of tangible eternity, finding an introspective state in my patient search for pure material balance. I have reduced my interventions to the simple title of rock stacking. However, to me this practice is so much more than just the placement of one stone on top of another. 
My ability to find balance has developed through years of the exercise, learning to understand the geometry and gravitational qualities of any rock I pick up. It is this attention, which lies somewhere between intention and intuition, that is the foundation of my work. I reach for the rocks that speak to me through their form and color, beginning with a base large enough to build onto while still subverting understood perceptions of natural forces in its placement. I search for facets, flattened sections, and divots which allow for me to nestle the next stone into a stable position. It often takes time to find a suitable orientation for my chosen pieces, but once I have selected a component, I work with diligence to ensure it is a part of the final construct. As with Sisyphus and his toil, it is this contest of man against stone which animates matter in this sense. To push against an almost immovable object creates a mental and physical state, a reality principle which illuminates our presence through the feeling of effort. A rock which is the object of so prodigious a human effort becomes itself human, Bachelard claims in his analysis of Camus' writing in consideration of the tragic king of Ephra. I take a similar approach in the construction of my cairns, striving to address this idea of anthropomorphism in the name of my pieces. Inevitably, however, my works do collapse in the process of their creation. Just as the stone of Sisyphus will certainly roll back down the hill, this failure is necessary for progress. The ruin of a cairn is revealing in that it highlights instabilities that require reconsideration. Despite the temporal nature of the work, that the tower will always fall, the goal of every sculpture is to postpone failure for as long as possible by creating sound lines of gravity through the stones. It is the instant between the placement of the final piece and the thunderous tumble of the form, its failure which constitutes its beauty, a climax in a momentary shift. As is the case in all other forms of art, completion is a subjective goal which is never truly achieved. A cairn may reach a height or precarity that solidifies it in my eyes as finished. However, there is always the potential for expansion the push to add just one more piece. This urge to find a boundary of possibility, a threshold of equilibrium that is on the precipice of the work's destruction, is at the core of my practice. In spite of the momentary character of my sculptures, I tend to eternalize their forms through photograph and video, capturing their fleeting existences and the rubbled aftermath of their failures. Often, if others are witness to my craft, I avoid taking this final measure, or freezing form in pixelated infinity. I battle the conflicted emotions of ossifying something so evanescent as my tumbling assemblages, but I do find I take photos, photographs in order to share my work with others. This act I find to be a su subtle braggadocio, a pride in my practice of challenging gravity. Regardless of my internal philosophical and moral contradictions in my work, it is in this search for purity of a solid form, the frozen moment of suspended mass, where I find myself in the nearest condition to Bachelard's dream of lifting mountains. Thank you. Hello, hi, I'm Lore, and I will be talking about the instrumentalization of architecture to contain hysterical women and the tension between the specimen and the spectacle. Sorry, my tutor was Dina Ziari in Psychiatric Aberrations of the Mind. Um, so in contemporary society, the word hysteria is symptomatic, relating to a crazy or fronting state subsequent to stressful events. I wanted to revisit a period of time in history when hysteria was an object of segregation and debate in the medical field at the end of the 19th century when it first originated. Firstly, I want to talk about one moment which I think is quite key and pertinent and really depicts this in-between specimen and spectacle state leading to this containment of the voice, which was during the Leçon du Mardi. So it is a class that was given every Tuesday by Dr. Charcot 
and it's showing the ease in which hysterics can be hypnotized. So here you see the patient Blanche Whitman, who was very famous because of her symptoms. Um, and in this photography, she was not a person anymore. She became an object for experimenting, a specimen that could be observed, touched, without limit, disregarding the connotation. And this behavior was legitimized by the medical environment. So consequently, the hospital and the architecture materialized a mechanism that sustained these theatrical methods of exploration, blurring the notions defining a person and a specimen, which then instilled the containment. At that time, hysteria was believed to infect strictly women, and at the hospital of the Salpetriere, Dr. Charcot was the one who pioneered the study of hysteria, and he was the one carrying out treatments that were supposed to heal the infected women. And in this sense, how did architecture, that is actually very much tied to the mind, intertwine with this specific illness? Could the architectural typology of the Salpetriere embody a scalpel, an instrument that dissected the disease, entailing a limitless search for the archetype of the mad women? How does it become part of the culture? How does the Salpetriere become a specimen in itself? On the plan of the hospital, um, there is a church, an amphitheater, a casting workshop, and a photography cabinet. And the Salpetriere became the church of medicine, a place of progress and study of the invisible forces that were mental illnesses, associating the structure to a tool of analysis. The doctors even developed feelings and fascinations for hysteria, creating a tension between the study and the observation. The casting workshop and the photography atelier glamorized the research. There is something quite artistic about the disease, about the art of hysteria. And in this sense, the architectural typology of the hospital creates a tension between fixation and pure clinical research, which then led to a containment. Finally, I want to talk about the iconography of the Salpetriere, um, which was images and text recording patients that served as a guide to identify symptoms or behaviors of hysteria. So that extended from yawning to sleeping, and it captured a tension between study and fetishization of hysteria that then immobilized women's voices, quite literally uh, captured and being still forever. Um, the patient, Augustine Inglés, who was also quite famous for her symptoms uh, captured in these photographs as her member contract, which was a sign of hysteria. And here the body of a sick woman is being fetishized. The specimen then becomes an extravaganza. And the composition of the photography, its lack of context of an existing recognizable architecture, emphasized the metamorphosis of the specimen to a spectacle that then entices the audience. I think that looking for madness through the Salpetriere's architecture, spatial elements, and documentation triggered another type of mania in some way, placing the architectural women at the threshold of study and observation. Thank you. Really engaging presentations. I'm just thinking whom I would like to address. Um, uh, again, just, just while kicking off, thank you to all of you for sharing those kind of quite deeply personal um, things. Took a particularly very moving and challenging thing to listen to, and I imagine a very challenging thing for you to write. So yeah, really well done in achieving that. I'm just buying myself some time. <laughs> Happen. No, I mean, usually one's listening and thinking and formulating at the same time, but the, uh, I think the intensity of your project kind of demanded a full attention, so you don't kind of synthesize a response as you're receiving it, which is, again, testament to your work. Um, yeah. I'm just thinking who I'd like to address still. Yeah, hi Jackson. I, I, I have for everyone, but I'm just going to keep it for Jackson now and we'll see how it goes. Right? I, the thing is, I went to Penzance a couple of days ago and I went to the Pebble Beach and I also then went to St. Ives and went to the Hepper Museum and uh, things like that. And it, your, your images and the way that you talk about balance, but even the stones that you use, the water, the sea, they kind of resonate with what I saw. But I was, I wanted to know, you kept calling it failure, right? Which was very interesting for me, because in some ways you kind of balance something almost like a Jenga-esque kind of move. You have recorded and documented everything, right? And the failure is not the moment of 
You know what I mean? Like there is this sort of thing that I found very interesting in the way that you position all that work. And I was just wondering, you know, if you want to talk about that, like why you called it failure. And sure. And um, yeah. Thank you. Um, I think the using the term failure, uh, it came mainly from the, the rest of the, um, the context of the course as well. Um, failure was something we had been looking at, not as a, a negative, but as, as in the, the failure of, um, I don't know, in, in the collapse, the failure of the ability to um, stand against gravity or weight or, um, and lightness, I guess, subverting that failure itself. And so um, I, 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 I chose to call the piece to the provocation of failure in that I, I, I do expect everything to fall. I expect it to collapse and I expect to learn from that. And I mean, that, that goes beyond just the, um, the literal um, fall of my, my cairns, but to a lot of other things that life has going on for it. And um, that I think it, what I started the, the presentation with, uh, those two little blurbs of text about meditations with patience and love are things that I take into my um, everyday life from a practice that did help me sort, has helped me sort out a lot of um, personal things, which is why it's such an intimate and um, a personal piece for me and probably the most important thing I think I've produced at the AA for myself. Um, but uh, yeah, calling it failure, I think it destigmatizes the word for me and um, it, it makes you realize that you, I mean, it made me realize you can, um, that failure is not something to accept as an end, but just a, a point to begin again. And so and that's, that's where it comes from. That you think those pieces that chosen did you kind of you know each time um, they, how did that, that happen? I, I mean uh, going back through all the footage because most of these clips come from um half hour segments of me setting up the camera all of the ones where you see me actually stacking the rocks sometimes i'm sat there for 15 minutes just moving two pieces around um the there there are stones that they do sort of speak to me in in that i pick them up and i i know that they are going to be a part of it and there are others that i just I don't pay any attention to, and that comes from the shape, the color, the um, the context of the others that I've already chosen, and um, everything there. It is very deliberate, and um, it takes a very long time to to sort it out. But I mean, I'm, I'm given what the the beach has, so that's where that comes from. Um, I have a couple questions. One for Charlotte, um, but I might follow on. Hold on, Jackson. One might follow on from you. Um, so, in terms of the writing prize, is what you presented as the movie was playing your text, or is this kind of an offshoot from what you submitted? So this is an excerpt from, the, a reworked excerpt from the text. Um, the, the full paper looks at um, different ideas of using stone as a material, and um, it compares Bachelard's uh, sort of metaphysical ideas of rock um, from some of his essays to um, Levi Strauss's um, raw versus cooked in the creation of art. And so since my art is sort of um, verging the axis of the raw and cooked in that I um, intentionally organized and oriented in the way, but using the most raw material. I was kind of intrigued I, because obviously I've seen the essay and it's more or less an academic essay, but what you chose to present was something else, which I suppose is where the essay is coming from, perhaps where mm -hmm. it's going to. And I guess I had a sort of vague question about what sort of response you were wanting. Because if you were to have presented your paper, we would have different responses, but you chose to present something else. And I, I did this also deliberately in that um, I, of chose, I chose images um, from some of my works for the paper. And I, I had figured that the, the panel had all read the paper. And so I mean, reiterating a lot of those um, more academic and research-based aspects of it um, didn't feel it, it felt almost redundant, not, not in that it would be redundant to share it with the rest of the audience here, but um, the process is lacking from um, a just text uh, from a PDF document. And so I thought it was something that it could not, um, the, this consideration of well, the, again, the paper I'd, for the prize. I'd like you to recognize that as a choice. Yeah. I think, you I, know, we I, could I, have yeah. totally, but I think you want the response to your work rather than mm -hmm. the essay, I, I which think, is interesting. Yeah. I think it, it's, it's to, the, to the work and to, um, I think, the emotion and um, sort of romance that goes into it for me. And um, yeah, I, I just wanted to make Thank sure. Thank you for you sharing. Thank if you. I can just like 
sorry, hog this for a second and parlay over to, to Charlotte. I really enjoyed your paper um, and this kind of critical discussion of magic. More to the point for me, um, slightly confessional, I care about nature, but I'm not really. <laughs> I guess I was just wondering how you really feel about this supposed separation of nature from human. I think you argued it quite powerfully. You mentioned the power of the human-earth relationship and how we've been disconnected to it for so long. Um, I'll just bookend that by saying uh, Hayduck doesn't seem to be belabored by that disconnection. I think the disconnection he's often talking about is between us as humans in response oftentimes to a city. So I guess I just wanted to ask you if your um, kind of anthropomorphic discussion is how, how faithful is that to the nature-human disconnection? Sorry, could you repeat the last one? <laughs> um, the, the, no, I'm not sure. This, the, sort of, um, the sort of anthropomorphic relationship that you're speaking to in your essay of mythologies, folklore, um, associations to do with, um, let's say, non-scientific yeah. and it, um, I have to say, yeah, anthropological ways of looking at things. How tied are you, uh, how tied is this discussion for you in um, a human nature separation, or is it just more of a what we do, anthropological? Um, well, that, it's interesting. So I'm going to answer this quite personally, but um, so I actually grew up partly in Hong Kong and Malaysia. And my stepmother is uh, Chinese Malaysian. And from a very young age, I kind of always had this feeling. I'm, 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 a, I'm a perpetual foreigner in this culture, and I've studied Chinese and everything, but I can never um, you know, understand the culture fully. But I always had this sense from the people around me, like, uh, you know, the traditional Chinese medicine culture, like that things look like what they're good for. That's always been a really big part of my life. And I've, I've been thinking about it recently. Um, and this might not be the answer to your question, but um, basically I've been thinking about how in European languages, we have this separation. There's no, you, you look at the word apple, it doesn't look like an apple, it's alphabetical, right? But in Chinese, for example, there's pictures of things and they've been reduced over time and they've changed and evolved. But I think that sort of, that made it very clear to me that there's something about Western culture that has this separation from language and nature, uh, from humans and nature, just by the fact of sort of labeling things um, through language. And it made it very clear to me, actually listening to Law's presentation, how uh, she's talking about these women, they're people, but once you label them, they, it becomes very easy for the, the other people to treat them in horrible ways and to have this justified cruelty. So I think, yeah, for me, it's kind of like, maybe if we had a little bit of, like if we believed in a little bit of spirit in the, the, the you know, that the tree has a soul or, you know, maybe we would care for it more and it's, kind of, it's kind of hard to think like that, but I think it's possible. Yeah. Yeah. So. I just think it's equally possible that it's, that's all. I was just wondering well, if it's the human nature separation you're wanting to heal. But, um, I mean, when you think about a cup, for example, like, I mean, imagine if you had a cup and, and you, you feel like this cup is very important, maybe it's got a soul, and then you don't want to throw it away because you feel like maybe that will hurt the earth, which also has a soul. So it's like, what is nature? Like, things that we create. I don't know. There's, what is nature, really? I mean, it's the connection between everything in the universe. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry, I'm transgressing your invitation to individual question because uh, Back less. okay <laughs> i'm continuing with my story year one find certainties and reference points year two big questions year three failure now but my maybe it's more a comment um why do we have difficulties 
being ready to ask a question to the three of you. So I was trying to think of this, and I'm venturing into well, my attempt of response, because you have already responded, because you've given us a text, a commentary on the, on the video. In a way, you've done the work, you've critiqued the work, and you've presented the work. It's sealed. You three are we are muted by, by the horror you're showing us. The failure of legislation uh, and uh, the possible attempts to justify or repair the damage done. The terrible act of um, forgetting that we are all interconnected with what's around us and the arrogance of pretending to control uh, different forms of knowledge and wisdom, and then I'm completely speechless on the violence to whatever, the body, gender, identity, um, designed by architecture and design at large. Um, so in different ways, um, you are, I have difficulties. Um, even trying to speak about this, because you are, you are absolutely um, right. And it, the, your topics are very difficult and, and, and very brave. And maybe they are not formulated in, as, as questions as we've seen in the previous panel. But they, they raise more questions. Um, I, yeah, it's just an open invitation to I have some response from you, just one footnote. In my language, what is called amnesty, it's called condono, which means forgiving. It's not forgetting, it's forgiving, which is even worse. Um, but, yes. I'm sorry, you have it. Why did you remind us that we are so terrible? <laughs> Yeah, I think that's, that's where the essay started for me as well. I, um, I read about the news and amnesty. It wasn't a word I knew before and um, seemed to be had a critical importance. So I looked where it came from and it sort of like um, made the essay because that relation between forgiving and forgetting um, was just so present um, in the cities and the legislation as well so it was a point for me to start as well that's etymologic connection thank you how was it to write it can i ask you to expand a little bit more on how you feel after writing it was it cathartic or not you mean to write or the situation not the situation um, the writing <laughs> writing um i, I I try to take this distance from my emotions uh, and my anger. I am not sure if I succeeded at the latter, but I did try to be really delve into the theory of it rather than how I felt about the situation. Um, it wasn't cathartic. Um, it was sort of um, it was sort of relieving to understand. Actually, like I. When I thought about it more, I um, I don't know, because after the earthquake, I, I felt utterly, like, absolutely um, useless. Like, I couldn't change anything, do anything. But um, after I read, after I wrote, um, after it, it was so present in my life during the term, um, it, it wasn't cathartic after that. Um, I wonder if I could super quickly, sorry, I'm not, I know I'm not officially on the table, but uh, just follow on from what um, Teresa said. So I don't know if you guys were present for the second years, but one of the students um, called for a, 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 a courtroom. And I, I mentioned that because I, I feel like Tura and Lore 
but like both of you have presented us with a case of like universal violence, which is insanely difficult to hold. I, I imagine it must be, it was, must have been very difficult for you to hold it long enough to be able to write about it. But also I feel for the panel because it's, it's you have presented us with a case of, of like a, a, a certain violence that transcends anything, anyone, any, any, any. Um, so congratulations. The, the difficulty, and, and this isn't necessarily something I would ask either of you to answer right now, but I suppose one question which I think would be interesting for both of you to consider is who is your ideal audience? If you could choose anybody in the entire world to hear what you have to say, who would it be? Answer, don't answer, no pressure. Okay, I'm just putting it out there. Charlotte. Um, I think you the the um, I think what you achieved, which is really wonderful, is I think you hit it on the on the nail when you said um, imbuing it with spirit, and that's what you're starting to do when you talk about these mythological, uh, sorry, medieval stories. I guess one one question earlier today we were talking about constraints and the constraint of establishing like a dis like a, a discipline. Um, and maybe one question again, just to think on, not necessarily, it's up to you if you want to answer it, is the, it seemed to me almost as if like medieval folklore would have been the obvious constraint in, in the discussion, in terms of like referential constraint from which to learn from. And in that sense, like I, I wonder what um, your final image, which is Studio Ghibli, Yes. Why is your final image Studio Ghibli? Okay. Question mark. <laughs> so the image, the final image, um, I'll just put it up now so you can see it. Um, but it's Studio Ghibli and it's the radish spirit. So it's a giant radish. So I just thought that was really lovely because she's squished, like she's made herself so small and the radish is taking up the entire elevator. Um, and I just put it there because I just like Studio Ghibli. <laughs> um, it kind of, to me, sort of says something about the situation, though, because like uh, what I'm trying to explain is like maybe, yeah, maybe the radish does have have a spirit. Like if you have a radish and then you have it in your fridge and you leave it to go moldy and then you throw it away, like isn't that very, really, really sad? Um, I just feel like the, the ep like because everything about the earth is so like it, it's all like uh, you know oh just buy another one it doesn't matter like that's the thing that's kind of destroying the earth and I think that yeah that's why I put the uh, the image yeah. of the radish but spirit. yeah so thinking point whether <laughs> yeah. whether that needs to be explicit if you are really encouraging us to adopt this mode of thinking where spirit is directly taken seriously and you say, okay, like today I, I cannot uh, believe in uh, the, the like ghost of the tree killing me, but make us believe, Charlotte. <laughs> you, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like do it, you absolutely can. And then um, Jackson, quick thought for you. You said my so many times. Yeah. It was powerful. It was intensely powerful. And I would maybe put out there as a possibility, slightly ex like excluding as an act because it becomes your, your art and your thing and your thing. And I, I suppose, I guess one question, maybe like slightly touched, uh, maybe your, I'm, my reading of your work is now being influenced by the panel, um, but what, when does when does the rock and the the rock uh, pi, uh, rock piling or stack. stack what when does it does it when or does it achieve an identity of its own and a being of its own and when is its life death failure outside of you? Sure. Yeah, um, 
Yeah, I can take this one. Um, yeah, I, this is something that I've been, I mean, well, per, first the, addressing the first part of using my, I mean, this was a very selfish um, paper for me to write, but I, I, it was something that I think I've been waiting to do the, the, the whole time I've been at the AA because, I mean, so much of the work I produce feels like it is um, to meet uh, what is expected of the the brief or anything, and um, what Catherine let me do throughout this course was just explore something that is so um, deeply personal to me and something that I have done with my my dad my entire life. Um, I, I just ran with it, and I wanted to make it as um, I mean as academic as possible in in the writing of the paper, but also as personal as possible in my expression of how much it means to me. Um, and uh, yeah, th th so that's the reason for, for so much focus on myself. And uh, I selected only the portions of the, the essay that refer to my own practice of it and how it makes me feel and how I go about um, creating these. And uh, I, I did edit slightly um, from what is written in the paper, but that's also because it's, I see it as a standalone work that I can um, look back on myself in the future is a reaffirmation for everything that I do and the effort I put into my work. Um, but going on to the, the sort of personification of, um, of the, the Cairns themselves, I touch on the es in the essay on the concept of animism and um, I briefly did in the, the narration as well talking about um, sort of Bachelard um, saying that it, putting effort into an object or putting attention into an object does um, give it a sort of spirit, which I think is is relatively similar to what Charlotte's um, spoken about as well. I mean, I when when I started hearing hers, I thought maybe the theme would be kind of this um, this creation of life where there is not um, necessarily human life, um, seeing as there's been kind of themes for the previous two. Um, sets of essays, but um, no, the, the um, anthropomorphism or the animism of the, the structure, I mean, it does come from, um, I don't know, seeing it in the context of people a lot of times too. So that's why I felt that one scene where um, you have the single tower and the man walking behind it was so powerful. And um, a lot of the works that I, I do create and that I do take photos of and then post onto my website or anywhere I do give names. So um, some of them are like river dancers or um, coastal wanderers, seaside sentinels, just things that are slightly poetic, but also frame the, um, the figures as um, characters almost um, and I think that comes also just from my love of um, narrative and storytelling and so I like to think of, um, of each of them having kind of their own personality and everything but when they, they fail I guess they, they do die but that's why it's, um, yeah, they're frozen in photographs. Uh, thank you, thank you for that. Laura, I have to make my own personal observation. I was, um, I was with Teresa, like how do we respond? But I, it did um, remind me of work I was doing as a grad student in the library. I was asked to process daguerreotypes, 1,200 of recently deceased people, many children. This is Spanish flu photography and mementos, et cetera. I'd never seen such a thing. And I couldn't make it past 600. You were asked to do this? Yeah, it was my work study project. Um, metadata. and. When I went to the librarian and said, I, I can't do this day after day, the images are too powerful, or I'm not suited, or something, she did take me through a conversation about the value of an archive, or the specificity, the context around why these things were being collected, and why the metadata was important to future researchers, and so on. So one way around the problem of how do we not talk about it is, since you had a specific range of work, institutionally linked, archivally linked, is that for you a structure that you can, in fact, deal with such images? Because I think I learned a lesson there, um, but I still struggle with it because the images do overwhelm. But I'm, I'm curious from your perspective, was that helpful to have that context? Or were you aware you were speaking to an archive as much as the content of the archive? Um, I think definitely the archive sort of made it easier to go through in some sense because also at least for the iconography, it's a proper clinical document, so it's very well organized, documented, so you can't lose yourself down this rabbit hole, though I quite still did with the subject. Um, but I think it 
made it even more powerful because somehow these testimonies won't be lost. It's just the interpretation through time that will change and that has changed now because at the time when they looked at this, they were just completely mystified by it. They took pictures, it was art for them. Mm. And now we're coming back to it. And you know, for me, it's even something that's nearly feminist in some way. Mm. Um, so yeah, for me, it's just the way we are reading it that changes and the archive allows that because if it was just boxed in some you know, random hospital and someone just found them, I don't think they would have you know, such power in some way. It's just, yeah, that's how I'm understanding it. Thanks for that answer. Um, yeah, um, maybe approaching the same point from a different uh, angle. Um, <clears throat> 50 years after the invention of hysteria, um, Breton and Aragon, the surrealists, wrote, a, wrote an essay which is, from our perspective now, <laughs> incredibly ill-judged celebration of 50 years of hysteria and, and used uh, elements of the iconography in it as well. And it was kind of kind of staple for Max Ernst and other uh, surrealist artists as well. And I guess and the, the question really is, we now have what we consider to be a very fixed position, I guess, on the iconography, but that, ha that has been put to different uses, it comes back to Mark's kind of thing. And, and, and to me now it feels incredible that they could read that as an artistic project after a world war in which they were all deeply implicated and with other similar iconographies being portrayed of wounded and mutilated bodies and kind of things like that. And I, I just wondered if you had any thoughts on that kind of, that 50 years of reception before at some point things change around. Um. During the Dada movement, it is true that they they were starting to, you know, uh, I think they made theater pieces about it and they really reenacted, like, uh, as I mentioned, there was something about the art of hysteria and that is sort of, I feel, what people remembered from it rather than just this actual clinical illness that was supposed to be treated. Um, I mean, of course, it's debatable, you know, to what one thinks about the fact that it just becomes so artistic and, you know, does that, um, do, do we forget about the suffering that people went through it um, when we make it something that's so artistic and uh, that's just far away from the clinical aspect of it? Um, probably the doctors are also what triggered it at the time when they were studying it. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's difficult to answer. Um, I think that as long as we just keep on remembering what has been done and, you know, just um, interpreting as we want, um, I think that's what matters in some way. Um, and uh, how can I put that? Um, it is part of a very troubled history. France has a troubled history over the last few centuries, particularly. And I think that people needed something um, how can I say, hysteria was uh, something, it was how women sort of emancipated in some way, like after it happened, um, I think their voices were actually liberated rather than contained as they wanted them to. And I think this is what people needed also after the war. They wanted something that would actually be linked to life. For them, hysteria was death and imprisonment and you know, just throwing women away in the, in the loony bin. But what comes out of it at the end after the war is they're actually grasping onto something that they thought was life and lively actually. So, yeah, I don't know if that makes sense, no, but... No, no, that's really interesting. Um, I've got a question for you as well. And I, and I absolutely agree with what Teresa and others have said, that, I just, you know, I can't begin to process the, the kind of enormity of it. And, and, and my question is really banal. It's a, a very banal question, but maybe it will lead somewhere. You, you said that there were a lot of amnesties in the 1980s and then you showed a slide and there were a lot of amnesties in the 2000s as well. And I just wondered what happens in the middle of that? What happens in the 90s? Is it economic? Is it social? Why, why are there these sudden bursts of them and then other periods where they're not happening at all? Um, I think it's because of the change in government, but that wasn't a specific um, focus of the um, of my research at least so I wouldn't be knowledge enough to um, address the whole history of amnesties but um, 
I know that what started in the 80s uh, is still ongoing and it's extended to um, 2018. And in fact, actually, um, this is quite interesting. If the earthquake didn't happen, another amnesty was, uh, was going to be put because it's, yeah, it was, it was on the way and something happened and got cancelled. We are on the hour. We have um, had the most intense morning. And, uh, I want to thank first year, second year, third year for their contributions. And not just the people at the table, but the, the whole of the year. I think there was a, an amazing um, effort across HGS. Um, and more power to you. I think some of the discussions here will reverberate through what Term 3 is all about more and more. Um, assessment, but discourse, discourse of the school and how much um, this lends to it. So uh, thanks. I'd like to thank our critics this morning, um, Jason, Lena, Doreen, Shumi, and Bernard. Um, thank you for your time and uh, attention and care. And thanks to everyone in the audience for joining us. And I would invite you to grab a sandwich uh, and exit quietly so we can, as a table, um, take some deliberations. But uh, wishing you all well for the rest of the day. And, Sylvie, we kick off at 2 o'clock with the uh, Diploma. 2 o'clock for Diploma, um, and then I think we can expect pieces to start around 3.30. Okay. Thank you. 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 Thank you.